If one travels up and down the state of California, you note that about a fourth of the area in this state is in country that's good for rangeland. It's not going to be cultivated. Much of it is public land. But if we're going to have agricultural returns from it, it's going to be with livestock, and it, that means mostly with cattle. And because of that, we have a place here, more than 5,700 acres for 40 years, where we've emphasized those kinds of issues. And I, I think the history of this station, is, as uh, Mike, I guess, said, uh, is, is going to be discussed back there. I don't need to go into it. But nonetheless, we think it is important that we be where the issues are, that we have people here who are studying them, and that we work directly with the people who are experiencing these situations. As years go by, we face a, a huge number of different issues. Some pop up, some, some grow slowly, some, not very many, disappear. But we also face continuing issues and continuing changes of, of how we're going to function in agriculture. Uh, Mike mentioned the uh, foot and mouth disease issue. If one looks at this morning's USA Today, they show the results of a poll that say 20% of the people in this country think that foot and mouth disease and mad cow disease are the same thing. Another 20 or 30% think that they're related. And about half the people in this country think you can catch foot and mouth disease by eating beef. If we're going to be in a situation where, where that level of misunderstanding exists, we have a real educational job in front of us. But we have a bigger one. When we say pests or diseases, People think of things like foot and mouth disease and sharpshooters and medflies and whatever else happens to be coming in at a rate of about one new exotic pest coming into California every 60 days. Almost none of them think of things like star thistle and medusa head and barb goat grass and the other pests that have come in and, and frankly given a lot of people hell in very much of the state. So if we're going to function, we have to be ahead of foot and mouth disease. We have to be aware of BSE, mad cow disease, but we also have to be constantly fighting star thistle and the other issues that we face to make sure that our, that our industry can stay strong, uh, can work well. And a good deal of today's program is going to address management of the range the relationship among plants and pests and management schemes and animals. And I think that's the way we've evolved very largely at this station, very largely because those are the issues that, uh, that seem to be facing most of the people around here. So I'm, I'm again, delighted that, that I was able to join you. I'm pleased that you're able to join us. Uh, I hope you enjoy the day. Roger. talk about uh, mainly uh, yellow star thistle and medusa head control work that we've done here at the field station. Uh, we've, we've done that on about a thousand acres and about 400 of that, uh, 400 acres of that we've got divided into some experimental fields so that we could test this stuff, these uh, treatment methods statistically. Our methods are, are chemical control which in some other work, we found that transline was most effective here against star thistle, and that's because it is a pre-emergence and post-emergence control, and because star thistle uh, germinates over such a long period of time, and we also use fire. I got to talk a little bit about our transline work in the plots because that's sort of the basis for this. But in '97, at a low rate, we didn't. That wasn't a great star thistle year, so we had 6% in the control plots and, and less than 1% in the, in the treated plots. The next year we didn't treat, and we got a lot of star thistle. And interestingly enough, even in the untreated plot that next year, 
we got some carryover control from the previous year, and since the chemical doesn't, um, doesn't have that long a residual, it has to be because we had such a good control over this star thistle, which we do have to point out and remember is an annual plant, so if you kill it before it makes seed, you uh, prevent the seed uh, production that year. However, it produces enough seed that it probably has a seed bank that lasts for four or five years. We don't know for sure yet how long that lasts in this area, but we do get some carryover from treatment. And then when we treated with the r low recommended rate in 99, we got actually complete control in our plots. So we uh, decided to take this into a field scale type trial, and we used um, eight fields that were 20 to 140 acres in size, and this is one of the fields. Um, we were able to graze normally in those fields, which you can't do in the small plots, so that was an advantage. And uh, we put some transects out so that we could test this statistically. And our treatments were the trans line at the low recommended rate, and we applied it by helicopter. Um, we did it in February or March, but I'd actually recommend January or February before the grass, while the grass is less than four inches in height. And then on our burning treatment, we, um, we burned in, in June or early July. We tried to burn at two to five percent flower on yellow star thistle, which is the recommended time based on earlier research by Di Tommaso and others. Uh, by the time you coordinate CDF and the air quality districts, it's really hard to get it done exactly when you want to. So our, we were actually around five or 10 percent bloom by the time we, we did burn, but we still got really good kill. We, we actually couldn't find any star thistle plants that survived the burn and flowered. Uh, with a rare exception, if in a wet spot or, a, or an area where the star thistle is real thick, there may be a few places, as the earlier speaker mentioned, where the fire doesn't get to. But those were pretty rare in our... So just to go over these treatments again, we, uh, we either use Transline three years in a row, which we call TTT, and then we use Transline the first year, burn the second year, Transline the third. This one we burned the first year and Transline the next two years, and then we had our control. Before we started, we we had essentially the same amounts of star thistle in all the fields. Really this difference in some of our tests uh, showed up to be significant, but at any rate we were fairly close in star thistle levels to start with. So after our treatments, this, this were our, was our observations in March. In June, after treating with Transline, and these little red marks just mean that those are the treatments that actually were uh, performed or done by that time, uh, we got really good control. Less than 1% star thistle uh, was left. Uh, the burn treatment, in this was done in June just before the burning, so that treatment hadn't actually taken place yet. Um, and by rights, these uh, amounts should have been the same, but for some reason this, this had a little more. Maybe it was a carryover from a bit more to start with. So the next year, uh, here again in, uh, in February, this, this field had been treated the previous year, and even in the control, uh, uh, none of these had much uh, star thistle in February, partly because it hadn't germinated and partly because it hadn't grown to the stage where we could identify it yet. Uh, but in the area that we burned the previous year, we had a whole lot of forbs, including star thistle. We had a lot of fillery, a lot of uh, rose clover, and a lot of star thistle. So you say, well, hey, that didn't work very well, did it? You got more star thistle the next year when you burned. But actually, I think it's a good deal, because we come in and spray that then. We get, we get a lot of star thistle to germinate. We come in and kill it, and then we can reduce that seed bank quicker. So then in, in our May observations, we find out that the two, uh, two years of Transline did a really good job, and, and the um, Transline, uh, which was really last year's Transline because we hadn't burned yet, 
Does that make sense? We did this in May, so the only treatment this field had received was transline the year before. And interestingly enough, just like in the small plots, we saw a reduction in star thistle based on the previous year's treatment as compared to the control here. Uh, and then in the burn, burn and transline air, uh, treatment, we, we had a little bit more, but statistically it's the same. So it suggests that the, that the burning works well, as, almost as well as the transline treatment. So then this year, we obviously haven't done our observations in May yet, and it basically shows that all the treatments have, uh, have worked well. Um, as compared to the control. So now the interesting thing that shows up here, and the reason we went through all this was, um, in the areas that we use transline, this now we were showing you the, the amount of star thistle present, now we're showing you the amount of medusa head present. Where we use the transline, we showed a lot more medusa head. And this, this agrees somewhat with what we had in our plots, which showed that where we could test area differences in the small plots, it showed that where there was, well, the, the, the effect was more due to location than it was to treatment, which, which causes us to conclude that if there's, a lot, if there's a substantial amount of medusa head present and you kill off the star thistle, medusa head is going to be one of the things that replaces it. And that's pretty, pretty much what happened here. But really interestingly, if you, on the treatment that had, that was burned one year, boy, you don't get that Medusa head at all. So the conclusions would be that, this, that either the treatments works well, burning or, or transline, but that if you use the chemical method, you should integrate a, a year of burning in there if you have a Medusa head present. Uh, so since we did this on a field scale basis, um, we could develop costs. Now we burned about uh, 200 acres at a time, two to 400 acres. Um, with us, it's easier to get along with the air quality district here if you do 200 acres or less, although you can do more. You, they'll let you do more, but it, it's a little harder to get done. So the spraying cost is 26 50 uh, an acre on basically two to 400 acres. It would be less with larger acreage. It'd probably be less if you did it with fixed wing, if you had an airstrip close. But in our terrain, and with no airstrip close, we had to go with the helicopter. The prescribed burning, which we thought would be a lot cheaper than, than the chemical treatment, actually didn't turn out that much cheaper at $23. We used our out-of-pocket costs for equipment, fuel and minor repairs. Our labor was high. We put in the, uh, the fire brakes and we assisted CDF in the actual burning and control of the burn. And then we stayed overnight and watched it and, and cleaned up the next day when they went home. So the labor's high. Permits in this county are reasonable. Some places they're getting a lot higher that would actually well, some places it'll be prohibitive. And we seeded the fire breaks, especially where they were on steep ground and would erosion might result if we didn't. Uh, and this is a separate deal. I, I guess what we need to make sure that we make clear, and, and the earlier speaker did a good job of that, is that this is a multiple year deal. If you decide you want to try to control star thistle, uh, you're going to have to be looking at two to four years at least and then some spot spraying as a follow-up. These are cost per acre, right? These are cost per acre, yeah, thanks. Cost per acre. This, so, if, if you're spraying the whole field, you don't need to do the spot spraying, but if, after you've treated it for, for a few years, or, or the areas where you have just minor infestations, you can go to the spot spraying and We've, we think we need to look at about 100 acres and then spray about 10 of the acres in, in that area or 10%. Or so the labor's high. The, the cost is for acres actually sprayed, but it includes the labor 
required to drive around 100 lake acres to find 10 acres to spray. Um, pardon me? That's cost per acre per year, yes. So these conclusions, I guess I've basically said already, but transline and burning are both very effective. Uh, it'll take a period of time plus some spot treatment. Medusa head uh, will probably replace some of the star thistle if you do have a substantial amount present to start with, and if you'll integrate burning into your program, that'll help you take care of the Medusa head. Probably some other weeds too, as we'll hear this afternoon. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the effects of fire on oak trees. Uh, I think both Mike and Peter have, have suggested and, and pretty much demonstrated that prescribed fire has certain benefits in terms of weed control, in terms of uh, reducing fire risk, uh, probably some other values also. And so there is a lot of interest in prescribed burning uh, in lots of different uh, kind of vegetation types, but certainly when we do it here in the foothills, we're going to have impacts to oak trees. Uh, foothill woodlands, the, the primary species of trees are, are native oaks. Uh, uh, and if you burn, you're going to affect the oak trees. Uh, it seemed like probably 20 or 30 years ago, nobody much cared. Uh, oaks were, were pretty much considered weeds. Uh, they were too abundant anyway, and there were cost share programs and other programs to, to get rid of them. And in fact, here at the field station, we have some large areas where, where we got rid of our oak trees for, for a variety of reasons. But I think in the last couple of decades, that attitude has really changed. And now we're, we're aware that, that these trees, uh, probably if, if the density is not real heavy, they don't reduce forage production uh, very much. And they have a lot of values which are really important. Wildlife habitat is certainly one of them. Aesthetics uh, in terms of stabilizing soils and, and making sure we don't uh, have uh, landslips and things like that. So now we're concerned about them and we want to know what, what the effects of fire might be on oak trees. Uh, and, I, and I put a, a poster together here which talks a little bit about some projects we've been involved in. We, we uh, this hill, as you can see, has, has been burned, and we've started a project here to try to tag a number of oak trees here and try to look and determine what the effects of fire are. And so these trees, they really look, they look tough after a fire. You often, uh, most of the leaves are singed, they turn brown. If you go up to the, the trees themselves, often the bark is blackened, and, and people commonly ask, you know, the trees, they're dead, aren't they? Should I be cutting them down? And so one of the reasons that we kind of undertook this research was to be able to, to kind of relate what trees initially look like to, uh, to what, how their survival and how their growth and how their response is. And as you can see, uh, even though the tree, the, the leaves on most of these trees were singed and brown afterwards, most of them look pretty good. Uh, they're, they're certainly on the lower branches, a lot of there is more damage. Obviously, the heat is going to be greater the closer you get to the ground. And so there is some, some damage even uh, eight, 10 months later. But most of the trees leaf out uh, normally the next year, uh, aren't really terribly adversely affected. It is related to size. Uh, bigger trees are more resistant to the negative impacts. And that's not surprising because the major damage is not caused by leaf scorching or damage to the leaves, but by damage to the cambium, which is the area just under the bark. And if you girdle a tree or kill that cambium all the way around, then the top part of the tree will die. Well, on bigger trees, the bark acts to protect that layer. And the thicker the bark is, the more protection there is. So when you get a, a bigger tree with thicker bark, uh, the, the damage to the cambium is less. And even when the leaves are scorched, the tree does recover. Now, if you go up there, you can kind of see some intermediate sized trees and maybe some small trees. You do have more top kill on smaller, smaller trees. Again, not terribly surprising, but oaks uh, have developed mechanisms to kind of live in this environment. Fires are a very common part of this ecosystem. At least they were until 50 years ago. Uh, we think that fire frequencies were, were in the neighborhood of a decade or so. 
Uh, now, we, with fire exclusion and, and really trying to put out wildfires, we have much longer intervals. But, but since oaks have evolved in this environment where fires were common, they've developed mechanisms to survive that. And one of the mechanisms is they're able to sprout back very vigorously after even the top part of the key is the tree has been killed. So in a fire like this, uh, we've done some preliminary work. It seems like about 25% of the trees, uh, the top part of the tree appears to be dead. Now that, that seems kind of high. You look up there and it doesn't look like every fourth tree. Most of those are small seedlings. Uh, so the top part doesn't leaf out normally. But about of that 25%, probably well over half of those do sprout back after the fire. And so that's giving the tree uh, a new start. Now, what are the long-term consequences of that? Well, if they keep sprouting, uh, there's sort of different theories about this. One is, well, with the exclusion of fire, this may be causing problems for regeneration. Fire was a normal part. We think some of the oaks aren't regenerating very well. If you excluded fire, you know, maybe this is a, not a natural ecosystem functioning, and that may be be affecting things. Under this theory, you're kind of, you're, you're favoring the oaks over other trees with fire because you're killing a lot of the competitors that don't re-sprout. You're killing some of the shrubs, you're eliminating grass. If that coincides with a good acorn year, then maybe these things can start. And even if it's killed back, then it sprouts up and grows vigorously. Well, there's not really a lot of good evidence to suggest that, but we do know that, fi that, that the oaks can uh, survive in these fires. They're probably more vulnerable, though. The, the new sprouts are, are tender. They're more subject to browsing by voles, by grasshoppers. Another thing we looked at this year was acorns. You know, do these fires affect acorn production? And we had a good opportunity to look at that this year because this is a great acorn year last fall. Lots of acorns on most of the white oaks, blue oaks and valley oaks. And so we had areas that were burned one year before and that were burned two years before in prescribed fires, very similar to this, sort of uh, early summer, midsummer burns. And we went back and tagged a number of trees that were burned one year before, two years before, and in controls. And interestingly enough, we would have expected that if you burn in June, the acorns uh, the pollination and fertilization has taken place. The acorns are very small, but you'd sort of think that that might, you know, kill a lot of those acorns, and then the following uh, fall you wouldn't see them. Well, it didn't seem to be the case. We could find no statistical difference in acorn production between those three treatments. It's, it's hard to, to, to take that and say, well, burning doesn't affect acorns, because if you burned at a different time of year, especially a little bit earlier, especially during flowering, if you burned right now, now it would probably be tough to get anything to burn now. But if you burned earlier where the, the stage of acorn production is different, you may have more negative consequences. But we couldn't, uh, couldn't really find that. Now, it, it seems to us that we haven't really tested this, that the interior live oak is, is more susceptible to fire. Uh, it has thinner bark in general for the same size, same size tree. The branches usually come down lower. I, I suspect it's because they're not as palatable to cattle. And usually their form is, is less tree-like and more shrub-like. A lot of these interior live oaks have multiple trees. You can see one right up here that, that was uh, killed by the fire. Basically, I mean, I, I'm not sure it's because the branches were low or it's more vulnerable. That was just an old tree that had lots of branches and it had a dead kind of center and the fire was able to get in there. But it does look as if interior live oak is probably more vulnerable for the same intensity of fire than, than blue oak is. Also, uh, foothill pine probably uh, appears to be more, more, uh, more, more vulnerable than the oaks. Pines are not able to re-sprout. You fry all the foliage on a pine tree and it's going to die, and that does seem. So in these fires, we are changing things, and you, you kind of have to look at the bigger picture. Do we want to you know, eliminate uh, foothill pine from the system. Uh, if not, then there's some things you can do to protect individual trees. That's sort of the next step in this uh, process. We're going to continue burning here at the field station. Uh, there's going to be other prescribed burns coming up. And we want to kind of get in ahead of time and, and identify trees with certain characteristic, take some steps to protect trees, and then 
initiate the prescribed burn and come back to those trees and see what preventative measures may be helpful in protecting trees. So uh, uh, I guess the, 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 the conclusions are that, that uh, there are these mechanisms that oaks have to withstand the effects that these medium low intensity fires, they don't seem to cause much you know, and I'm basing that on the fact that our overall mortality has been, been fairly low. It's very hard to tell just by looking at trees right after fire what the long-term consequences are. And, uh, and even if the trees are killed, they usually re-sprout from the base. Hydrologists and society uh, managers have been concerned about the co hydrologic consequences of vegetation management at the watershed scale for about the last 45 to 50 years. We've been concerned about the water quality consequences of vegetation management at the watershed scale for about the last 10 to 15. And we actually know a fair amount about certain types of vegetation management and their effect at the watershed scale on hydrology and water quality. Um, what we know a lot about is the vegetation management practice known as type conversion, if you, if you think in, in the old range terms. Type conversion basically involves coming in and completely converting a, a woodland of some type, a chaparral or an oak woodland, to a, a forage-based um, community, basically, to annual or, or perennial grasses. And there's a, a lot of literature strung throughout the forestry the hydrology and the Journal of Range Management, um, various journals on this subject. Um, basically, when you come into a, a system like this foothill behind me and you change the vegetation community that's there, you're going to inherently affect the hydrologic budget of this hill slope. You're going to affect the nutrient cycling of this foothill or of this um, hill slope, and you're going to affect the erosion processes that are occurring. Um, Basically what we know when we come in and do a complete type conversion, like that hill up there, for instance, work that was done over at the Hopland Field Station during the 50s, 60s, and 70s by Bob Berkey, um, who was uh, the, in the hydrology department at Davis, basically showed that you removed the interception. So when you've got these woodies up here, basically they're intercepting 10 to 15 percent of the rainfall that falls onto a system, and that's trapped in the canopy and is often lost back to the atmosphere's evaporation. So you immediately gain an additional 10 to 15 percent of, of rainfall that hits the ground. Um, you also remove the evaporative demand of, of the oaks or the chaparral or whatever the woody species might be, and you release a fair amount of water that would be lost out of the soil horizon, particularly into the late part of the, of the growing season, back to the atmosphere. And one of the consequences of, of that has been augmentation of summer flows where we've seen a lot of, of watersheds, perhaps on the order of that one right up there, that would be intermittent or ephemeral at best. That is, it would only flow during the wet season. Um, Berge showed that when you do type conversions on, on these type of systems, you actually generate perennial flow. So you, you dramatically affect the water budget. And a lot of the work, if you read the research that's been published from about 1940 through about 1985 on watershed management, you would equate watershed management to type conversion, because that was the, the primary type of work, that watershed hydrology work that was done um, during that time period. And the focus was society wanted, particularly in California and Arizona, society wanted more water. They wanted to augment water yield. So, so there's, there's a lot we know about vegetation management and its effects on hydrology and water quality, but there's a lot that we don't. One of the things that we don't have a lot of knowledge on is is the effects of prescribed fire versus wildfire. So there's a, there's a lot of impetus t for us to get out into these systems, as we've heard, and manage the fuel loads. Um, one of the concerns that, that, that's been raised that I've heard several times is what are the potential water quality impacts of conducting prescribed burns versus using grazing livestock to control um, fuel loads versus mechanical methods. Um, and what are the ramifications of not coming in and, and making those fuel load reductions and having a large wildfire? What are the water quality ramifications of that? What we were able to do up um, basically this direction, about six miles as the crow flies, there was the Williams Incident Fire, which occurred in September of 1997. And it burned around 5,300 acres. And it was a pretty hot burn. It occurred in uh, 
September it was uh, Indian summer, very warm. We had a strong north wind, and I know a lot of us were concerned that it was actually going to come right on in and burn um, significant portions of this station, including some of our study areas. Um, what we were able to do, working with Glenn Nader and um, Randy Dahlgren, we were able to um, identify a site, the Thousand Trails Campground, which some of you may be familiar with, which is just up of, of Collins Lake. They were kind enough to let us come in and monitor water quality from a 100-acre watershed that had been intensively burned during the fire for two years following the fire. So we monitored it for the 97 and the 98 water year. And we looked at uh, total suspended sediments, we looked at turbidity, we looked at nitrogen, phosphorus, and the major cations and anions. And we sampled for two years, and we sampled really intensively. We, it's a bit hard to see, but basically this is a, a graph of the, of the blue is the flow, the runoff data from one of our experimental watersheds right here at the field station. And the green and red are sample points. So you can see that we sampled very heavily throughout the runoff year. This represents a period from January 10 through February 25th, and that's actually supposed to be 1997. I've got it labeled wrong, but that's 1997. So we sampled, we collected 100 plus samples from that watershed focusing on storm runoff for two years. And we're fortunate enough that we've got four experimental watersheds here at the Sierra Field Station, three of which are also up in that direction are actually, as a crow flies, only four miles from the Thousand Trails watershed that we sampled. So what we're able to do is, is to make some comparisons between the water quality that we saw following the wildfire at the Williams incident versus the water quality that we saw on our experimental watersheds. Very similar vegetation to begin with. I think there was probably a bit more chaparral on the Thousand Trails site than we have here, but not much more. The soils are very similar. They were responding to the same rainfall events, the same storms. And basically what we found is the real story is in turbidity and in suspended sed sediments. If you look here, we've got suspended solids and turbidity in milligrams per liter and, and nitrate. This is the mean concentration for 1997, the year following the fire. And this is Thousand Trails, and these are our three watersheds here at the Sierra Field Station. And we had um, significantly higher suspended solid and turbidity levels coming off of the burned watershed. Now again, I don't have pretreatment data because we, we didn't know there was going to be a fire there. Um, but there's no reason to suspect, looking at the soils that are there, looking at the vegetation that was there previously, there's no reason to suspect that these, this watershed would have had inherently high, um, basically, erosion levels like that compared to the other three watersheds. And if we look in the second year, we see the same pattern, so, but it's a bit lower. When we look at nitrate and ammonia for the same watersheds for the year following the fire and the, the second year following the fire, the first thing we notice is that there's basically no ammonia coming off of any of these watersheds, the burned one or our watersheds up here. Ammonia is, is trapped in the environment. It's um, trapped to the soil, trapped organic matter, and it's simply not very mobile. So it's not that surprising that we don't see a lot of it, although we did expect to see some of it coming off perhaps as ash in runoff following the fire. But we didn't see a large, we didn't see a large concentration. And in the following year, we actually, again, we're in the same level. And when we look at nitrate, basically nothing surprising, nothing interesting stands out from Thousand Trails. It doesn't appear to be very excessive nitrate levels coming off of there. What this data does for us is two things. It's not, a, it's not a statistical test of the effects of fire, but what it does give us is some good information on a wildfire in this community. These, this is the, the water quality that followed it for two years, so it gives local folks some information about what type of water quality we might expect, what range we're looking at. And it also gives our research team here at Sierra, as well at the, at the Hopland Field Station, some information about if we apply a prescribed fire treatment to our, our experimental watersheds, what level of treatment effect can we expect? We're not looking at orders of magnitude increase in nitrogen or phosphorus, but we are looking, going to be looking for significant increases in suspended solids and turbidity, which when you look at a lot of the literature that's out there, um, when Bob Berge 
um, over at Hopland converted his watershed from wood to woodland to uh, grassland, he found, I think it was a, a fourfold increase in the amount of erosion that occurred in the five years following his treatment. So that is somewhat substantiated. What we plan to do is, so at, here at the Sierra Field Station, we have four experimental watersheds that we've been monitoring collectively now for the last four years, collecting baseline data. At the Hopland Field Station, we've got seven experimental watersheds that we've been monitoring for the last two years, collecting baseline data. Three of the watersheds at the Hopland Field Station are Chaparral, four of them are Oak Woodland, and all of our watersheds here are Oak Woodland. What we're doing now is, is collecting the baseline data so that we can come in, in in a year or two from now and implement some prescribed fire treatment and have the baseline data that we need to really test the hypothesis, what is the effect of prescribed fire versus no fire on water quality and hydrology in these systems. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about some of the experiments we've been doing on controlling goat grass through prescribed burning. And in case some of you don't know what goat grass looks like, I have some uh, samples of what the seed heads look like. Um, so you can pass those around if you want and um, just give them back to me later so you don't go back and spread them onto your own places. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, history of goat grass in California and also um, uh, some of its ecological characteristics that have enabled it to do so well here, and then I'll get into a little more about the control that um, we've been doing an experiment on. Um, goat grass was introduced to California um, around 1910 or so, and was first reported in uh, Sacramento County in 1914. Um, this is relatively late compared to other annual grasses that were introduced um, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, from these initial introductions, it's gone on to spread across different sites in um, Northern California and into Southern Oregon. Um, and once it establishes at a site, it tends to um, slowly uh, accumulate a lot of cover um, and or slowly crowd up the other forage species that are there. Um, people are concerned about goat grass because, um, and if you have it, then you know why, um, cattle don't like to eat goat grass, and because it becomes such a dense um, population, it excludes the other um, forage species that you are interested in having your cattle eat. Um, so um, early estimates have shown that um, grazing capacity on pastures infested with goat grass reduces from 40 to 75 percent. Um, so there's that concern. Also, goat grass is of concern um, just in general in wildlands because it, does, it crowds out other species, it crowds out natives, um, and it takes over areas that were previously thought to be um, relatively resistant to invasion by these, such as um, areas with serpentine soil. And at Hoplin Research Station, there are a lot of serpentine areas that have been taken over by goat grass. Um, so uh, one might wonder why this is such a successful grass. Um, there has a few characteristics that are pretty unique. Um, first, it has a lot more deeper and extensive root system than the other annuals, and it's a late annual, so it um, matures later than the other grasses. It's more similar to the phenology of Medusa head. Um, so this might allow it to take advantage of the water resources that are available um, more effectively than um, other annual grasses that are here. And the second thing is if you have seen the seed heads, you would notice that the seeds come in two different sizes on one um, plant. So there's Towards the bottom of the seed head, there's a relatively large seed. Um, these tend to germinate the following fall. Um, but towards the top of the spikelet, there's um, these smaller seeds that um, form a persistent seed bank. So um, in subsequent years, these smaller seeds will germinate. Um, this plays an important role when I'm talking about um, fire in a little bit. Um, the other interesting characteristic, I think, about goat grass is that it has relatively um, tough litter to decompose. So it tends to build up a really thick layer of RDM that um, is much more dense than other species RDM. And goat grass seed germinates really easily um, just laying on the top of this litter layer. It doesn't need to work its way down into the soil. So it has a relative advantage compared to the other species that are out. The, most of the focus on controlling goat grass recently has been focused on um, using prescribed burning to get rid of it. Um, so I'll talk about that, but uh, 
first I wanted to talk about some other methods. Um, you can go out and handpick it if you have a relatively small infestation, which um, I've done in a couple places um, amongst my plots where there's just a really small patch. You just go and make sure all the seeds have popped, um, picked up, um, and that seems to work pretty well. But obviously you don't want to spend hours and hours working on this if you have an entire ranch or pasture filled with this. Um, also, there's been one experiment done um, looking at the effectiveness of using Roundup to um, eliminate goat grass, and it doesn't get rid of it completely, but you do get a significant reduction in the cover. Um, but more of the research, especially these last few years, has focused on using prescribed burning. Um, we've been doing burn experiments here and also on um, Nunez Ranch, which is a part of the East Bay Municipal Utilities District um, in, down in the Bay Area. And um, also Jody Tommaso has been doing some burning studies at Hopland. And the overwhelming result has been that burning is very successful at reducing goat grass. But there's a catch to it. Um, I mentioned before that um, you have these small seeds at the top of the um, goat grass seed head that um, form this persistent seed bank that can last you know, five or six years. So it's really important to do more than one burn. Um, we found um, both here and at a Nunez Ranch site that after one burn you do get significant reduction, but you still have a substantial amount of goat grass, but it's really the second and if you have, if we've done it, the third or fourth burns that really knock back the goat grass cover. Um, at the East Bay site, um, it, after four burns, um, goat grass was virtually undetectable. Um, there were a few scattered goat, goat grass plants around, but um, nothing that was actually on a transect. Um, but it was really key that um, there were these consecutive burns. Um, as far as the work we've, we've been doing here at Sierra, um, when, oh, let's see, two years ago, this entire area was burned. Um, there were um, some pretty dense patches of goat grass here, and um, we d just the entire thing was burned. And then um, I also had plots in two other watersheds where um, that weren't burned at all. Um, when I compare the, uh, the amount of goat grass, and you can actually look on your, in your book, there's a, oh, you have mine. On the second to last page, right here, there's actually a nice picture of goat grass too. Um, on this graph, you can uh, look on your own copy. Um, in the unburned area, there wasn't really change from um, 1999 to 2000. Um, in the percent cover of goat grass that there was, but um, between 1999 and 2000 in this area, there was a significant reduction in the amount of goat grass after burning it, um, and this was just one, one time. It went from over 50 percent cover down to less than 10 percent, um, and, and even where it was in this area, um, there weren't these really dense patches of goat grass like there had been before. So um, what we did last summer then is all these areas where I had installed plots, um, we split up each plot so we'd have a paired plot. And so here's one of my plots. Um, Dave had uh, some people come out and clear a hand line around one half of the plot and then the other half would be burned um, last June. So this, it ends up, this one was burned two years ago but not last year. Um, this side was burned and the part you're standing in was burned um, for the last two years. Um, so I can't tell you the exact re quantitative results about this because I haven't sampled um, the cover yet. That's going to happen here in the next month, but just um, qualitatively throughout this field season, um, in this area where things have been burned once versus twice, the, um, this that's burned twice here, has ver I haven't found any goat grass seedlings here. Um, on this side where um, it was burned two years ago, but last, last year it wasn't burned, um, there are some seedlings, and I was going to grab one. So there are seedlings. Um, there aren't that many, but um, it's still around. Yeah. Um, and you can see from this, and that was one of the bigger ones I found, um, it is quite a bit behind all the other grasses, but it'll um, catch up towards the end of the growing season. Um, in the other plots where we didn't burn them and last year was the first burn, um, the parts that were burned, um, there were a lot of goat grass seedlings this year, but not nearly as many as in the unburned areas. So it seems like we will get a good reduction of goat grass cover in those areas, but it won't be completely eliminated. So um, 
the plan is um, this summer we're going to reburn those areas and try to uh, knock it back even further, um, hopefully to levels that are um, you know, less than 5 to 10 percent, um, which is a lot easier to deal with. Um, so why, why, does, why is burning working? Um, well, I mentioned that goat grass is a late annual, so um, the strategy for timing is the same as with Medusa head, where um, you wait until the other grasses have set seed, but um, goat grass is still not mature yet, and you can use those other um, plants to carry the fire through and kill the goat grass seed before it's finished maturing. Um, this, this seems to be one of the mechanisms that this is working through, but um, one of the fires we did in the East Bay occurred much after goat grass had already dropped its seed, and we still s saw um, a good reduction in goat grass cover um, after that. So there must be another mechanism that's at work. Um, a couple hypotheses I've had about this are one that um, removing the, this mulch layer um, exposes the seed to predation by the rodents. So um, if you have this high mulch layer, it's harder for them to find the goat grass seed. So just getting rid of that um, helps um, reduce the goat grass the next year. And also, um, in my planting, planting experiment that I did in the um, RDM plots up there, which you haven't seen yet, where we have manipulated the different levels of RDM on these um, plots, um, the plants that grew in the areas that had been ungrazed for the last few years um, were much bigger and much more robust than the plants that grew in areas with really low RDM. And so it seems like um, if burning removes the RDM, the plants that do grow don't seem to be as um, successful, um, they look kind of sickly, and they don't, the seeds aren't as big. Um, I haven't tested whether the seeds are, have a different germination rate than the other ones, but it just seemed like overall the plants were less healthy, and um, that might be another mechanism by which fire is helping control goat grass. For California rangelands, we know that um, the composition and production of rangelands is primarily determined by the characteristics of the site and the annual weather pattern. So what you see here is a product of, of that site, and it's also a product of the particular kind of weather that we've had, we've had this year. But given that weather controls the amount and time, kind of forage that's produced, we also know that we can manage the amount of forage and the composition of the forage by manipulating what we call RDM or residual dry matter that's present on the ground in the fall at the time of, uh, time of germinating, germinating rains. Now, we have a long history of, of management of annual ranges using RDMs as, RDM as standards, and the agencies all use that. Um, there are some guidelines for RDM levels that, for example, you can read in Forest Service Handbook uh, the guidelines for managing hardwood rangelands have some guidelines in them, um, and, and other publications have those guidelines. But the guidelines are based on a relatively slim body of research. This was research that was done on some experimental plots through the state in the 1970s by Hetty. Um, all of this background, by the way, is in summary form in your publication, so you can read the um, the paper that's, that's in this. It's got some references as well. Um, we, we often manage or look at grazing capacity on annual ranges using what we call a scorecard approach. And the scorecard takes RDM standards for a given site and brings in the factors that control animal distribution. On a site like this, the flatter ground has, tends to have deeper soils, more productivity, and also higher concentrations of livestock. Steeper ground, like that slope up there, has, has less livestock use, and then you get onto even steeper ground, you have even less livestock use. So we've developed this scorecard approach where we look at the um, slope, the RDM standards, and we also include in that, in that standard the amount of woody cover. If you look on the slope behind you, you can see this is more typical range where it's it's covered with, with trees. We also know the amount of woody canopy influences the amount of forage produced, where scattered trees tend to actually enhance forage production, but a denser stand tends to suppress it. So this scorecard has proved to be extremely useful. Um, it's recently been um, developed into a scheme that 
incorporates uh, remote sensing and GIS into an approach where you can now um, take cover off of an aerial photo and incorporate that with digital elevation models for a given site to come up with some pretty good estimates of, of grazing capacity. And this has actually been adopted now by um, Tulare County now does their assessment of rangelands using the scorecard, scorecard approach. However, the scorecard approach is something that has been developed so far simply using experience and um, judgment of people that are familiar with that uh, kind of land to develop the recommendations. So in this study, the primary purpose of this study is to develop validated numbers for um, this, to go into the scorecard that are based on the amount of production and also the composition of production you get with different levels of RDM on different slopes. And so here we have a block of experimental treatments that are on um, relatively flat ground. The slope here is a couple of percent. On the background, in the background slope, that's another, that's another slope class. The slope there is um, about 15 percent. And then we have another set that are over the hill that you won't be able to see that are approximately 30 percent. So this is a former oak woodland cleared of any, of any cover. The, this site is grazed by livestock down to a base level of about 1,500 pounds per acre. And that will be done after we're done with sampling, which will be about a month from now. So animals come in, it's grazed down to that level. And then the station staff, and they love this project, Dave especially loves this project, um, without their help we couldn't possibly do this, uh, comes in and clips these plots by hand down to their four treatment levels. Well, we clip four times during the year to get the amount of biomass above ground. We've also sampled below ground biomass. And so we measure forage growth under those different treatments. And then in the spring, we measure the composition to look at the kind of forage that's, that's produced. This project also has, as a, as a goal, a look at a, the tie to water quality. As you all know, water quality is an extremely important part of range management. We have no direct links to the RDM recommendations and RDM levels to water quality issues. And so we've used the lower, the lower ends of the plots it's not quite as obvious here, but it is up there. The lower half has a catchment now built in it where runoff and sedimentation is being um, monitored um, and will be monitored on these sites. Now, um, we're doing this artificially, so it's going to involve uh, rainfall simulators and the addition of, of rainfall, and that will start um, next year. So it's just getting set up. So if we did it now, you can see there's a lot of bare ground. We'd have a lot of erosion problems there. Now, what's happened? Um, in, this, in this study. There are three graphs on your sheet. Either if you have it, can share it with your neighbor or can look at it later. Um, the top graph shows the amount of above ground biomass, same as forage, at two times of the year. One time is February, so that's the end of winter. That would have been a few months ago. And then the second one is a peak standing crop, which here is going to occur um, in another few weeks or so. What's interesting is the, the RDM treatment had different effects at different times of the year. The most growth of grass was in the ungrazed plots. And this is, this, the dead stuff is taken out, so this is only live. So that meant that the plot that Mike is up against is the one that had, in February, had the most biomass. So there's significantly more growth there. It was a little over 1,000 pounds um, there over the last two years, which is the summary of these samples. Then as you go to lower levels of RDM, the amount of growth in the winter drops off to where the lowest amount was, as you might guess, where the lowest level of, of RDM was present. By May, that effect had changed, where by May, the highest levels of RDM um, were actually in the um, moderately grazed plots where the, and this, this by the way is not grazed during the growth, growing year. It's only grazed um, at the beginning of summer. So there's no grazing during that, during that time. Um, so we have the, the highest levels of biomass are on the 600 to 800 pounds per acre plots at the end of the season. The growth at the, on the ungrazed plots has dropped off some. And so that's where the highest level of production is. And this is, at least for, for this study, suggests that that 600 to, or the 600 to 800 um, target for RDM 
is suitable if you want to optimize the amount of production that you get out of these kinds of, of grassland sites. Um, this, the middle graph is an interesting one. It's a, actually a pretty boring graph, but the results are interesting. It's got just four bars on it. This is the number of species per plot. And so this is an estimate of species richness or species diversity. And the species diversity was also highest on the 600 to 800 pounds per acre plots. It drops off, and it's actually the lowest in the ungrazed plots. And so a lot of you have heard comments about grazing enhancing um, diversity in rangelands and under undergrazing resulting in a decrease in diversity. Well, here's an example where that actually did happen, where we get the least diversity on the ungrazed plots and the most diversity on those moderately grazed plots for this, for this site. Now, what happens to species composition? There are some significant differences, and I've just got three here. Um, fillery, I'm sure those of you that know range can guess what happened with fillery. There was more fillery on the heavily grazed plots and the least on the ungrazed plots. So that's not a big surprise to people. The, um, the other thing that probably isn't a big surprise is this pasture has a lot of Medusa head in it. There's no goat grass except the goat grass that Amy planted, but she claims she removed it. So there's no, no goat grass right here in these plots. Um, but Medusa head is an extremely important part of this, of this pasture. In fact, this pasture was burned, what, five years ago or longer than that? It was looked it up about eight, I think. eight years ago. It was burned to reduce Medusa head. It was a very successful management burn, but the Medusa head has come back. It's about time to, Mike, get on it again. Um, but Medusa head is also very strongly favored by no grazing, and so the most Medusa head is in the ungrazed plots. And as you get to the higher grazing levels, Medusa head does not disappear. It goes down to about, it's about 13 percent on the heaviest grazing treatment compared to about 27 percent on the, on the no grazing treatment. So it's related to grazing pressure, but the, the kind of grazing, or the RDM treatment that's done here is, does not um, um, reduce, um, eliminate Medusa head. The other interesting result here is that clovers um, this, uh, were most abundant on the lowest RDM treatments. There's no difference between the heavy, moderate, and light grazing, but there is a difference with no grazing. And so in that kind of a plot, and actually there's a bunch of these, so that's just an example. On the ungrazed plots, there's significantly less clover than there is on the grazed plots. So um, these are, we've been doing this, uh, we've now got two years worth of data out of this study. We've added another aspect, so there's a whole another replication of these plots that's over the hill on another aspect. We've got one year out of that. We're continuing to do this study. Uh, we hope to get some good information about water, but so far we're getting some really good information that I think can refine the RDM standards, the scorecard, and probably most important, it's going to give us some information about how uh, this, or these RDM treatments affect diversity and also production on on annual rangelands. Now, RDM is, R, the RDM treatments we use aren't exactly the same as, as grazing, as you all know. So there may be some differences with seasonal grazing treatments and the like, but, the, but the, all of the RDM studies have shown that clipping RDM down to these different levels in an experiment show basically the same kind of response that you would get through grazing. And so it's a much more convenient way to do that than to try to use livestock to get to these different treatment levels.